Hi, this is Alex Schumacher, creator of Mr. Butter Chips and Decades of Inexperience, and you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented comic artist. He is uh, new to the show. This is his first time on. Um, he is not the race car driver based on his last name, but he is talented in his own right. He is, of course, Alex <laughs> Schumacher from uh, Mr. Butter Chips and uh, Decades of Inexperience. How are you doing today, Alex? I'm doing fairly well, Kurt. How are you? Doing good, doing good. So it's rare that I have first timers on the show anymore because usually I'm seeking out people, but you came to me. So this is a good way to promote yourself, which thank you for coming on the show. But for, the, for those that don't know anything about um, Mr. Butter Chips or your, your decades in of inexperience, tell us what those are all about. Sure. Uh, so decades of inexperience was my first foray into web comics, which began in 2015 with a online publisher called Antics Press. So I was just coming off of about, you know, t a year and a half, two years of trying to focus on my writing specifically, had a few short stories published in online literary magazines, and was really trying to just uh, bone up or, or improve my skills in, in that regard. So Decades of Inexperience was my way of kind of dipping my toes back in the comics uh, milieu while also kind of being prose heavy and then about six months or seven months after that I got Mr. Butterships going with an online uh, literary magazine also called Drunk, Drunk Monkeys which is not quite as contrived as it sounds um, but we got that going in 2016 uh, it was it initially started out just as a pastiche of underground comics from the 60s and 70s, which I kind of discovered in my 20s by way of the alternative comics that were being published at the time. And just kind of fell in love with, with that style and some of the things that they were saying. <laughs> uh, some of the, you know, sort of iconoclastic uh, stances that they took were great. So Mr. Butterchips kind of started as, a, as an homage to that. And then the election of 2016 happened and, you know, not to get too into politics, but it, the comic became sort of a vessel for me to, you know, kind of express my frustration um, with the way things were going. Well, luckily the uh, senior orange is no longer there, so you should have a little yeah. more sanity, so to speak, when it comes to comics. Yeah, and that was one of the ideas behind relaunching it with SLG. Number one, SLG Publishing is a you know luminary in the indie comics field, and some and a publisher that I always wanted to have a project um, with. So I had known Dan for a couple of years, and with the ousting of the former administration, we needed to do something to not necessarily rebrand. I don't necessarily like that word but to at least reinvigorate the comic and bring it into an, a, a post you know trump era so it's a little bit more uh surreal hallucinogenic still touching on some of the issues that mr Butterships has always touched on intolerance equality acceptance you know overall love even though you have to kind of wade through the ramblings of an inebriated capuchin. <laughs> <laughs> but that is the main, you know, uh, point of that comic. So with SLG, I was able to, you know, reconfigure it a little bit for, or retrofit maybe, better word, for, for a new era. Just in reading it, it has, to me at least, it feels like it has touches of our crumb in terms of its stylistic approach. Uh, Definitely. When, I mean... True, a true underground comic artist in in his own right, obviously. But it, it's great to see, you know, the 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 harsh lines, the shadowing that you have. Like your dialogue is is appropriate for that genre of of mm -hmm. comics, so it works out very well. And um, you know, from what I've read out of out of the eleven pages that you, you sent me, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing more because I, I 
I like these one-offs that you have where it's not a, a sequential story, but at least it's it's uh, almost Farsight-esque in the sense of, you know, this is what I want to tell on one page, here you go. So it's wonderful to see that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it was uh, Outland, actually, which was Burt Breathed's Sunday-only strip mm -hmm. after Plum County. That was a big inspiration behind the the newer version of Mr. Butterchip. So it's sort of these episodic installments that touch on different, you know, issues like the gig economy and, you know, the service industry. And again, you know, things like intolerance and they're done in a little bit more, I guess, well, subtle, maybe not incredibly subtle, but more <laughs> subtle than they have been. <laughs> so, so again, Outland was a big inspiration behind that, but also R. Crumb and Gilbert Shelton, who I absolutely love. He did fabulous furry freak brothers. So that he's always been a big influence of mine. Um, so yeah, it was just a way to, you know, bring the comic into the, you know, 2021. And it, it was almost, the comic was almost like a visual sigh of relief <laughs> to some degree. <laughs> Do you think uh, the underground comic scene is still alive and well, and, and can we learn anything from it? You know, I, I think with the way that people are able to self-publish and kind of syndicate themselves with the advent of the internet and, you know, sites like Webtoons and things like that. I don't know that an underground movement still exists, but it, it all kind of falls under, under the umbrella of indie comics at this point. But I do believe that there's something to be learned from it because mainstream comics tend to preclude creators from certain stances or talking about certain things or depicting certain things. So the independent movement or the alternative movement, however you want to refer to it, you know, that allows us to be more free with our storytelling and, and a bit more liberated in what we can talk about and how we can talk about it. So I think there's something very freeing about that. I, I almost painting myself into a corner or pigeonholed the comic a little bit with with the the whole you know targeting the former administration so this has definitely allowed me to sort of shake that and and be able and again freed me to just be able to talk about whatever <clears throat> excuse me I wanted to so it, it, yeah it's it's liberating in a way because I don't have to rely on the stupidity of the government <laughs> necessarily that's still in there i mean there, you know there's still some commentary about that but yeah the the newer relaunch with slg has has given me some freedom which is nice which is in a way it's more fun because it's not just distilling the aggravation <laughs> of everyday life anymore it's you know it's still sort of shining a light on some of those things some of those aspects but I could do it in a, from a place that's a little more enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> you know, speaking of over the last four years and, and of course dealing with a pandemic, you're, you're dealing with a lot or everyone's dealing with a lot for that matter, especially when it comes to being creative. Um, has that stopped your creativity or has it given you a chance to reinvigorate yourself? The stress of, of the pandemic. Yeah, for me, I was actually able to... Uh, transition into being a full-time cartoonist during the pandemic. So for me, it was absolutely rejuvenating because I was able to create without the added pressures of having a day job or without, you know, that kind of secondary life, I guess. Maybe that's not the right phrase, but, you know, when you're juggling a day job and creativity, those two can tend to clash. And at times when you come home from a day job after working eight, nine hours a day, being productive is not exactly the first item on your agenda. So giving, being allowed to create full time and write and draw full time has allowed me to not only be more productive, but have this sort of, I guess, weight that's, that's lifted because I'm no longer 
worried about necessarily time constraints. The, the concern that crops up in this specific scenario is my own time management procrastination. And I have to be very careful about keeping that in check and monitoring that. <laughs> so really that, but you know what, that's a good problem to have. I don't mind, you know, dealing with that kind of thing. So yeah, the pandemic, and I know a lot of people have expressed that, you know, the depression and the anxiety and the isolation of the pandemic has certainly, you know, zapped their their drive or their motivation. And I could understand that completely. I see why that would happen. But for me, luckily, it seemed to be the exact opposite. As we're living our life in, in this set of, in these times, I should say, would you rather have no more challenges in your life or would you ha rather have no more obstacles that stop you from happiness? Yeah, I think, I think the obstacles from happiness would be the, the, if I could choose, if I had a choice, mm -hmm. that would be the, the element that I would remove. Cause I think everything else is pretty easy to, not easy, but it seems less insurmountable. Whereas obstacles to happiness just completely well, I, I guess happiness is something that you need in life <laughs> so not to derail my own my own thought uh, you know train of thought but I think it's important to be happy and whatever that means I mean there's different definitions for everybody and for me I'm I've been working on my own mental health for the last few years and I think that was an important element that people found during the pandemic that that was something that they maybe needed to contend with um, in a way that they didn't before. And I think that was true for me also. And, you know, there, there's nobody who's happy and excited 100% of the time, but you can find this baseline. Whereas I, I feel like before I, I would just dip into these depressions that were incredibly difficult to crawl out from for, you know, weeks at a time. So when you're actually facing these issues head on, there's something, I guess, helps with the creative process because you're not necessarily in these, in, you know, have all of that weight of the additional frustration and anxiety and stress. So again, you're going to have days where you don't feel like being productive. You're going to have days where you don't feel like working and that's perfectly fine. I think taking breaks is an essential part of being creative, but getting yourself to a point where you're at least content. I think that's, that's incredibly important. And you have to be more concerned with your own personal well-being than anything else, because the, at the end of the day, that's what's most important. And I think a lot of people, especially the younger generation, because they've grown up with it, put a little bit too much stock in social media. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these, if their posts don't get a thousand likes mm -hmm. or, you know, if their impressions are low, they take that as a commentary on their own self-worth, which is incredibly damaging. So I think working on your, just your own, you know, mental fortitude is really one of the most important things you can do, not just as a person, but as a creative too, because that's going to allow you to be able to continue creating if you're in a, you know, decent headspace. Amazing. After all this time of being creative, you're, you're still, if you think about it, you're just one person out of 7 billion that's creating stuff. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's this sea ocean, this vast ocean of people creating things every day and, and new creators, you know, establishing product pro projects every day. So yeah, I mean, that really is what it is, is you just, you know, one shimmer on a sea of, of creative people. You can find an audience online. Mm -hmm. You know, th that is the nice thing about the internet. I, you know, it's kind of much maligned when I'm talking to my wife because social media can definitely have it, its, you know, tribulations and, and pitfalls. But it also has its promises and its positive aspects as well. And I think one of those is finding an audience, which you may not have been able to find through other means or through traditional means, just you know, putting your work in local comic shops or trying to get it published somewhere, you know, at the internet grants you this direct access to an audience. So if you're savvy, more savvy than I am, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you know, this is, 
an absolute possibility. So there, there are a lot of positives about social media too. I don't mean to, you know, sit here and harp on all of its bad qualities the entire time because for, especially for cartoonists or artists of any kind, starting today, you know, the internet is a huge boon to finding their audience or finding, you know, networking, you know, doing all of those things that are necessary for a person in the arts. What's the most difficult uh, part about your artistic process? <sighs> probably being satisfied. <laughs> I know that's probably a really common answer, but you know, I've had to get to a point where, you know, nothing's ever going to be perfect. So I had to get to a point where I was at least satisfied with what I was producing and I was comfortable <laughs> with other people seeing it. And that's still a struggle to this day because it doesn't matter where you are in your career there's always going to be people who don't like what you do and there's always going to be people to reject what you do that's just uh, you know a part of being in the arts it's entirely subjective so those kind of comments or those kind of reactions are never really a personal attack even though it can feel like it so yeah i think the hardest thing for me is being able to get my work to a point where i'm comfortable with people seeing it and just, so just being satisfied with what I'm doing. It's never going to be a hundred percent. And I've come to realize that over the years, but you know, 70%, 75% satisfied. I feel like, okay, that, that can go out into the world. Of course, dealing with um, a creative career is obviously something that not every parent is usually uh, okay with, but I think it's improved <laughs> in, in these last few decades. Do yeah. your, uh, do you find that, if you're say talking to a younger generational person like at a convention or online do you find that they're automatically always down on themselves because they're not as famous as some other people might be i think there are some and i you know i even kind of envy this a little bit there are some that are able to emerge with this just this confidence <laughs> in their work <laughs> You know, and and I I think that's great. But yeah, there are there are a lot that I have interacted with online that, you know, the, again they don't get the amount of likes that they would hope, or they they measure themselves up with somebody who already has an established career, and that can be really damaging. So, you know, the best advice that I can give them, and the advice that I try to give them, is that you're the only person you're competing against and you should be the only person that you're competing against because in these industries, they should be far more about camaraderie than competition. So I try to instill that in people, if they're asking for my advice, I try not to give unsolicited advice because that doesn't typically go all that well. So if I'm actually talking to somebody and they are unhappy with their own progress or with the reactions to their work, that's that's the main piece of advice that I try to give is just try to improve, you know, where you were yesterday, be better tomorrow. You're the only one that you're in competition with. And as long as you are progressing and you can see the progression and, and feel confident with your work, that's really all that matters. Because again, as I said before, there are always going to be people who don't like what you do. You're never going to please everybody. That's just an impossibility in the arts. And it's subjective. Again, it, you know, the best artists in the world are technically, you know, technically speaking with their, um, you know, with their technique, those artists have plenty of people who don't like them as well and decry the projects that they put out into the world. So it's, it is just subjectivity. And it's, if you can understand that, and it's difficult to get over rejections or people speaking ill of your artwork, it's tough and, and I'm not going to sit here and tell anybody that it's not it it can hurt even when you've been doing this for you know 15 years but I, I think as you continue on those kind of rejections get a little bit easier to endure is that basically how you learned your life lessons was through rejection <laughs> yeah in more ways than one um, but yeah I, I think with the arts you kind of have to go through those experiences to build the kind of, you know, exoskeleton that you need <laughs> to take those hits because they're going to come in spades. I mean, that's just part of being in the industry. And if you can't take 
criticism, if you don't if you don't develop that thick skin, then you're going to find yourselves or you're going to find yourself quitting a lot sooner than you should. But but I guess that's the other aspect too is if you if you can walk away from from some sort of artistic endeavor, then maybe you weren't meant to do it because I've thought about walking away almost every day. You know, you get you get to some point where you're dissatisfied or, or upset with something that you're doing, or you, you don't have the momentum that you wish you you did. And so it's very easy to think, well, maybe I should just quit and walk away. But I've just never been able to. So maybe it's pertinacity or tenacity or just straight up stupidity. But <laughs> either way, I, I haven't walked away yet and don't plan to anytime soon. I mean, if you want to call a spade a spade, you're a glutton for punishment, plain and simple. Oh, yeah. I mean, cartoonists are masochists yeah. for sure. Just don't get paid for bucks. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like a fetish property without the, the actual income. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, no early wage today. I guess I'm going to just be an artist. Okay. Yeah, you're just punishing yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. But that's also, I guess, you know, piggybacking off that a little bit is I tried to produce comics or involve myself with publishers that I thought would be a stepping stone uh, to the direct market. I tried to take on projects that I expected or envisioned to be stepping stones to my big break, which never panned out. So, you know, in my early 30s, I came to the conclusion that I may as well just write and draw the comics that I prefer to create because if I'm going to fail, then I may as well fail on my own terms. And, you know, as, as I am proving every day that can make the, the path to success a little bit longer, but in the end, I think I'm going to be, you know, more satisfied with, with my output. If your life had a movie title, what would it be? <laughs> oh man movie title I think it would be the indomitability of stupidity <laughs> or, or naivete maybe the the, the enduring <laughs> the enduring plight of naivete <laughs> sounds like an art uh, house something film along those, something along those lines <laughs> <laughs> what would be the sound what would be that, that opening song for that then I'm curious now Maybe Barbed Wire Love by Stiff Little Fingers. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that, the, I think, you know, obviously it's about a romantic relationship, but I think it pretty perfectly encapsulates my relationship with the art, with, you know, creating as well. Yep. It's, it's very much a, a love-hate relationship. <laughs> Is there anything else that I missed that you'd like to showcase with the those that are watching and listening to this? Well, with Mr. Butterchip, so there is the new series that started in May, but that actually was kind of engendered by the book that SLG put out last summer. So that's a collection of the comics that I was doing with Drunk Monkeys from 2016 through 2020. So that's available through SLG. There are new t-shirts that are available through SLG. Um, and then I'm shopping a book with my literary agent right now so if something comes of that you know i'd love to come back on and talk about it if you're yeah if you're willing i'm i'm always down for having people come back that want to showcase their work so don't oh don't, excellent don't worry about that you'll always have a, <laughs> a space open just have to schedule it everyone has one or two people that inspired them on their path to where they are today who was that for you first and foremost for me it was a cartoonist named maury turner he created the first racially integrated comic strip called The Wee Pals. And I was lucky enough to be introduced to him in my early 20s when I first moved up to the San Francisco area and was sort of running in the Cartoonist Society, the Regional Cartoonist Society chapter and the Cartoon Art Museum circles. He was just this profoundly talented and I don't know, and, and just beacon of love. He taught me not just about creating comics and being a sort of uh, a good artist to work with, being somebody who, you know, ingratiated themselves to the industry, but also just being a decent person. And my time with him was, you know, will endure 
<laughs> you know, well beyond our, you know the time that I actually spent with him. And uh, unfortunately, he passed several years ago. But there's not a day goes by that I don't think about the lessons that he taught me and the techniques that he showed me. And he always said, "Keep the faith." Which he was a religious man, but it was more about faith in yourself, faith in others, faith in your abilities. And so that's something I really try to keep in mind, you know, in my own daily ventures, you know, in productivity. Other people are Michael Jancy, who created the Norm comic strip mm -hmm. for a long time. It's still still going online right now, but he was huge in giving me, you know, cr constructive criticism on my work and, you know, showing me areas where I needed to improve. Uh, Keith Knight, who did the K Chronicles, was was a huge part of my life uh, at that time and made an impact. A lot of the guys from Pixar, like Jeff Pigeon. Um, so I, I think those are, you know, the Bay Area um, creators. Oh, Judd Winnick. Um, he does Hilo now. He did Barry Ween. I, I got to know him a little bit through uh, some of the Cartoon Art Museum members that I knew. So I think that's kind of the core group of people who I who I knew personally that really affected uh, my trajectory as an artist. Cool. Yeah, Michael Jantz, he's a great guy. I've had him oh, on the show wonderful. before. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's, he's lovely. And it, we still keep in touch, which is really nice. He he did a blurb for the Mr. Butter Chips book, which was really kind of him. And Ruben Bowling, too, actually, mm -hmm. who does Tom the Dancing Bug. Uh, he, he was so gracious and I ran up to him at one of the conventions in my early 20s and I had I had been familiar with his strip and he was kind enough to introduce me to his editor at the time uh, you know at Universal Syndicate nothing ever came of it but that was more due to my lack of ability at the time than it was with Ruben's help so he was he was huge when I was first starting out as well and his help has always been appreciated and he did the cover blurb for the Mr. Butter Chips nice. book <laughs> From a professional standpoint, you've created comic books. You've showcased your work at conventions. You've done a lot in your career. From a professional standpoint, you are considered successful. But from a personal perspective, are you successful? I would honestly consider myself personally more successful than creatively at this point. And that's not to say that I haven't found some sort of meaning or success in my work but again kind of going back to the conversation that we previously had i think personal success is almost more important than creative or artistic success because that puts you in a position to be more creative and be productive and be in the correct mindset and, and emotional state to create so yes, I, I do consider myself personally successful, thankfully. <laughs> the, art, the artistic success I'm still working on. Uh, everyone's working on their own success that yeah, way. Yeah, absolutely. It is what it is. <laughs> it's, it's an ongoing process. It's always in progress. Yeah, definitely. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? You know, I, I curl up in the fetal position for about 24 hours and cry, and then I move on. <laughs> I, I think you have to allow yourself a short time to react because again, a rejection or, or failing with a project is never a commentary on you personally, but it feels that way because when we create, it is from a very personal place. I mean, it's almost like progeny because we, for all intents and purposes, did birth these ideas and these characters. They are a part of us. So it can feel very personal when you fail. So I think it's okay to give yourself a little bit of time to be upset or, you know, comfort eat or <laughs> whatever you need to do to get, you know, past that hump. But then you need to move forward and keep working. So for me, and I think when you're starting out, that's a little bit harder. So I've been doing this you know, not including breaks, I've been doing it for about 10 years, you know, really trying to get into first the syndicated comic strip industry and then into comic books. So it, it was much harder when I first started because you have this, these delusions of grandeur where you're going to bring your work out into the world and everybody's going to recognize your genius. And that's just not how it works. So I think at this point, yes, it still stings when somebody doesn't like what you do or doesn't think what you do has any value. 
but I can let it roll off my back a little bit easier at this point, probably because I've just, you know, experienced so many <laughs> failures and rejections at this point. And, and you've survived. That's the main thing. And I've survived. Yeah. And, and that's the thing is you, you will always survive. There are far worse things to endure in this life than a failed project. The younger generation are looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own right, whether it's as an artist or a writer or whatever they'd like to be. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I think in a lot of ways they already are, from what I see, especially in the traditional publishing sector, where they all have graphic novel imprints at this point. And the creators and the editors, who a lot of them are also younger than I am anyway, you know, they are making great strides in diversifying the creator pool and making sure that marginalized voices are being heard. And I hope that just continues and, you know, is, is even more broad as the years go on. And they're also, in North America specifically, they're also, you know, trying to make it known and make it kind of more common knowledge that comic books are not just about superheroes. Because for some reason here in the country where they were created, you know, Marvel and DC have kind of had a monopoly on on the industry for so long. And I think if you ask the average person what they think comics are about, or if you mention comic books to them, automatically they think Spider-Man. So the younger generation are, are again, you know, diversifying the creator pool, which has been necessary for a very long time. But they're also creating stories that are, you know, encompass a much wider variety of genres. And so the the comics reading public or, you know, potential audiences in this country are starting to see that comics are just as venerable of an art form as movies or novels or music or anything else. And, and so they're already moving in that direction, which I think is fantastic. Well, I do hate to say this, Alex, but that ends this particular episode of Two, Two Geeks Talking. You'd figure I'd know why the name of my own show after all this time. <laughs> But before I let you go, though, where can we find you on social media and everything like that on the Internet? My main website, my artist website is alexschumacherart.com. Um, you know, you can see how to spell my name there on the screen. So it alleviates some of that difficulty uh, on Twitter and Instagram. My handles are both AJ Schumacher art. Try to keep it easy, mainly for myself, because I'm getting older and my memory is getting worse. So those are the main places to find me online. And also the SLG uh, publishing website, which is slgpubs.com, I believe. And that's where the Mr. Butterchip series runs every Wednesday, new episodes. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Check out Alex's work. Follow him on Twitter. You have a YouTube channel as well, too. So YouTube channel, same thing, AJ Schumacher art. Yeah, yeah, and I'm planning to do more tutorials and Q&As and stuff, so there'll be additional uh, content up there shortly. Well, anyhow, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Uh, thanks, Alex, for coming on the show. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, as I say every week, you can find this interview and thousands of others on our website, tgtmedia.com, or our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash c forward slash tgtmedia. Everyone has a story to tell, and it's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching. See you next week. Hey, all Kurt Sasso here from Two Geeks Talking. If you like this video and these quick clips here, make sure you take a look at our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe as well. Hit the bell to make sure you get notifications, of course, from videos like this here. Uh, thank you everyone for listening and watching over the years and keep listening and watching for new and exciting interviews with talented and creative people in the entertainment industry. I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Thank you so much.